A Journey to the Center of the Earth by Jules Verne. Oh, yes, I found it on the side of the road. A table of contents. A little bit about the author. We'll skip that right now. Chapter One The Great Discovery. Looking back at all that has happened to me since that eventful day, I am hardly able to believe that my adventures were real. They were so wonderful that, even now, I am amazed when I think about them. I was living with my uncle, a German, who was a professor of philosophy, chemistry, geology, mineralogy, and many other ologies. Professor Hardwig, my uncle, had invited me to study under him. That's what he looks like, Professor Hardwick. For I was greatly interested in learning as much as I could about the earth and what lies underneath its surface. Although my uncle was a most learned man and could speak with the greats of the scientific world in almost any language and could classify 600 different geological specimens by their weight, hardness, sound, taste, and smell, he did not at all look the part. He was 50 years old, tall, thin, and wiry. Large glasses hid his vast, round, bulging eyes. His nose was thin like a file and was constantly being attracted to tobacco. When he walked, he stepped a yard at a time, clenched his fist as if he were going to hit you, and then walked on. At most times, he was far from a pleasant companion. But Professor Hardwig is by no means a bad sort of man. However, to live with him means to obey him. So when he came home one day and began to call, Harry! 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 I hastened to go at once, even though at the time I was more interested in finding out what was being prepared for dinner. Hastening to the professor's call. Then what my uncle wanted from me. I took the steps three at a time and presented myself to my uncle and his study. My uncle's study was a perfect museum filled with minerals of every kind. When I entered, he was studying a book, not even aware that I had joined him in the room. Wonderful, he said to himself as he studied the book. Wonderful! The book was an old one, yellow with age, just the kind of book my uncle enjoyed the most. Did you want me for something, uncle? I asked. It is the Helmskringla of Snor Tarlson, he said. The famous Icelandic author of the 12th century. It is a true account of the Norwegian princess who ruled Iceland. What language is it in? I asked, hoping that it would be a German translation that I could read. But my uncle would have nothing of translations. Only originals would do. It is a runic manuscript, he said. The language of the original peace and people population of Iceland. He was angry at my ignorance. My uncle had picked up the book to show me the strange letters of this language when a scrap of paper fell from between two of the yellow pages. My uncle seized the paper like a hungry man snatching at a morsel of bread. It was an ancient parchment, about three inches by five inches, with strange-looking characters written all over it. It is runic, my voice, my uncle de declared, his voice and fingers trembling. I looked at it closely. Little did I know then that this small parchment would lead us on one of the most wonderful, wondrous adventures ever known to man. But while my uncle couldn't read runic, he could not decipher the meaning of the letters on the parchment. Just then, the cook called up to us that dinner was ready. I cannot be bothered with dinner, my uncle yelled. But I was hungry and went to dinner. I was just finishing the last of my dessert and wine when I heard my uncle roaring for me to come at once. I made a leap for the stairs to his study 
So loud and fierce was his call. My uncle was sitting, staring at the small piece of parchment. I declare to you that it is runic, he yelled. It contains some wonderful secret that I must get at, at any cost. I looked at the letters on the parchment. They made no sense to my eye. Sit down, my uncle cried fiercely, and write what I tell you to write. I obeyed at once. I will substitute a letter of our alphabet for that of the runic, he said, and we will see what we will produce. He dictated the letters of these twenty-one words, none of which made any sense to me. Scarcely giving me time to finish taking them down, he snatched the paper from my hand and examined it with deep concentration. I should like to know what it means, he said, as much to himself as to me. But I certainly could not tell him. It reminds me of a cryptograph, a puzzle, he said. I may be on the verge of a great discovery. My opinion was that it was all rubbish, but I kept that opinion to myself, as my uncle's anger was not easy to bear. The parchment and the book the parchment and the book are written in different hands, he said. The book is about 200 years older than the parchment, so that parchment must have been written by some person who owned the book later than the original owner. So the next question is, who owned this book? On the inside of the cover, my uncle found what at first looked like an ink stain, but on closer inspection, it proved to be a line of writing, almost rubbed away by time. My uncle studied the letters. Hmm. Comparing the parchment and the book. Arn sukasum, suknasum, arn suknasum. My uncle cried in triumph. He owned this book. He was a brilliant Icelandic professor and chemist of the 16th century. It was he who wrote the mysterious words on this parchment. Perhaps some astounding discovery of his. My uncle walked around the room in a state of excitement. Until I discover the meaning of these words, he vowed, I will either neither eat nor sleep. My dear uncle, I began. Nor will you either, he cried. I was glad that I had just eaten an unusually large meal. My uncle and I tried various languages and variations of languages on the letters of the parchment. We worked for hours, but the parchment yielded no clue. My uncle felt certain that Sak Musum had written his message in Latin, as most educated men of his time wrote. But the order of the letters provided no known Latin words. Working for hours on the parchment. Then, my uncle began reading the puzzling cryptograph all sorts of ways, according to some theory of his own, and he had me write the following. It still made no sense to me. My uncle became enraged. He struck the table with his fist, then left the room and the house, slamming the doors behind him as he went. Slam, slam. I sat down for a while, relaxing and smoking. Then my mind returned to the parchment, and I picked it up and began studying it again. I found a few scattered Latin words, an English word, and several French words. It was enough to drive a man mad. The heat in the closed room was too much to, to bear, and I began to fan myself with the parchment. For the first time, I saw both the front and the back of it. Imagine my surprise when, glancing at the back of the parchment, I saw that the ink had gone through, revealing the Latin words, criterum, 
crater and terrestrial earth. I had discovered the secret. All I had to do to, to read the parchment was to look at it backwards. My eyes were dazzled and my hands trembled with excitement as I began to read. But what horror and shock possessed me as I discovered the terrible secret. It had really been accomplished. A man had actually dared to do what? I immediately made a decision. No living being should know the parchment secret. Never! I cried. Never will my uncle learn this dreadful secret. He will immediately undertake this terrible journey revealed in the message. Nothing would stop him. I could not allow such madness, nor could I take the chance of my uncle discovering the message. I would have to destroy it. I snatched up the book and the parchment and was about to toss them into the fire when my uncle entered the room. He did not even notice what I was about to do as he took the materials from me and began to look at them carefully. My flesh crawled as I realized that he might soon discover the way to read the parchment in its terrible secret. Hours went by, but I dared not leave the room. I went to the sofa and soon fell, fell asleep. When I awoke, my uncle was still at work. His red eyes, matted hair, and feverish hands testified to his work. I loved him, and I truly felt sorry for his suffering, but I could not reveal the terrible secret. He continued to study the parchment as night turned to morning and morning turned to afternoon. At about two o'clock, he gave out a yell so loud that I almost fell from the sofa where I was still resting. Backwards! He cried. It is backwards! Oh, how cunning Saknusum was! Then he began to translate the parchment. Descend into the crater of Yukul of Sneffels which the shade of Scartarus caresses. Before the candeds of July, audacious traveler, and you will reach the center of the earth. I did it. Arn Saknusum. My uncle leapt three feet off the ground, then ran about the room wildly, knocking over tables and chairs and tossing his book up in the air. We start at once, he cried, and you will share my glory. Start for where? I asked, afraid of the answer. To the center of the earth! Chapter 2 And here we'll pause for water. Chapter 2 Starting the Journey It didn't take long for my uncle to take a book of maps from the shelf in order to explain Saknusum's message to me. You see, the whole island is composed of volcanoes, he said as he pointed to a map of Iceland. And they all bear the name of Jokul, which means glacier in, Is in Icelandic. But what does the word sneffels mean? I asked. I knew you would ask, my uncle answered. Follow my finger to the western coast, past Iceland's capital, capital Reykjavik. Rick, Rick, Reykjavik. Do not know how to say that word. I followed his finger. There, he continues, that peninsula, shaped like a thigh bone, with a mountain in the center. Do you see it? I had to admit that I did. That is Sneffels, he said with some satisfaction. It is a 500 foot high mountain which shall be our doorway to the center of the earth. Impossible, I cried. Why, the professor asked. Because its crater is probably choked with lava, with burning rocks, and with many dangers. Suppose it is extinct, he said, that it has been dead for many years. That would make a difference, I admitted. But what is all this about Scargerus and the Kalins of July? This shows how much Saknusum knew about the area, my uncle answered. The Sneffels Mountain has two peaks and many craters. Saknusum is careful to point out the exact peak and crater. He lets us know that at the end of June, the sun is positioned in the heavens so that the shadow of Mount Scargerus 
one of the peaks, falls upon only one crater. That is our highway to the center of the earth. But the theories about the heat, I began. I care nothing but for theories. My uncle answered loudly. Neither you nor anyone else really knows anything about the interior of the earth. The only way to learn its secrets is to go and see for ourselves. I left the professor and went to see Gretchen, my uncle's goddaughter, and the girl I hoped to marry. Though my uncle had warned me to say nothing about our adventure, I had to tell her. What a magnificent journey, she said. If only I were a man, I would go with you. It is a journey worthy of the nephew of Professor Hardwig. Oh, Harry Lawson, I envy you. I had not expected that Gretchen would be... I had expected that Gretchen would be against this mad journey. That she would beg me not to go. But her approval was the final blow. I returned home to find my uncle in a state of great activity. Hurry and get packed, he said. You are wasting time. We are really going then? I asked, hoping that he would give the journey some more thought. We leave the day after tomorrow at daybreak, he answered. We went by train from Hamburg, Germany, to Copenhagen, Denmark, and from there by Schooner to Reykjavik, Iceland. The trip was a hard one, the seas rough and wild. We spent most of our eleven days at sea in our cabins, sick and pale. Ugh. When we docked, my uncle was so haggard, he could scarcely climb to the deck. When he stepped on a deck and looked around, however, his face brightened and he stood erect. He took my arm and held it tightly. Behold! He said, pointing to a high, two-peaked mountain in the distance. Behold the gateway to the center of the earth, Mount Sneffels! I smiled weakly, but said nothing. The worst difficulty is behind us, my uncle added, as we left the ship and headed for our hotel. How is the worst difficulty behind us? I asked with a cry. All we have to do now that we are here is to descend into the bowels of the earth, he answered matter-of-factly. I would remember his answer many times in the days to come. Later that night, we had dinner with a Mr. Fredrickson, one of Iceland's most learned scientists. We told him nothing of our planned journey, explaining only that we were here as tourists. However, we did learn from him more of the story of Arn Saknusum. And what we learned made the reason for the coated parchment clear at last. My uncle had asked Fredrickson if the library in Reykjavik had any books written by Saknusum. You will not find any such books here in Iceland, nor anywhere else, the scientist said. Why not? I asked my uncle. Because Saknusum was accused of heresy of opposing the beliefs of the church, and in 1593 his books were all publicly burned. But to turn to a more pleasant subject, Professor Hardwig, I hope you will find time to visit here to examine some of Iceland's minerals. Some fine examples are to be found in Mount Snuffles. I might consider visiting there, said my uncle, barely hiding his delight. That will not be an easy trip, however, said Fredrickson. There will be no boats to take you across the bay. You will have to go by land, along the coast. But it's a very interesting route. To get you there, you will meet with the guide. And I have just the man for you. I will bring him to your hotel tomorrow. The following morning, when I awoke, I heard my uncle's voice coming from the next room. I joined him and was introduced to a tall, strongly built man. His red hair was long, and his eyes were strong and intelligent. He seemed like a man who could be trusted. His name was Hans Belzik. Hans agreed to guide us 
to a village on the slope of Schnevels and remain in our service during my uncle's scientific investigation. Little did Hans realize at that time that he would make history with us by accompanying us to the center of the earth. Accompanying. Accompanying us to the center of the earth. We spent the next days get, getting our equipment together. Besides the normal climbing tools, pickaxes, crowbar, crowbars, a ladder made of silk, iron shod alpine poles, and strong rope, we took the following. A thermometer, which would read to 150 centigrade, or 318 Fahrenheit. A manometer to measure atmospheric pressure. A good watch. Two compasses, a night glass, and two rum, rumkorf's lanterns, and a battery to give us light. Our arms consisted of two rifles and two six shooters. I couldn't understand why we'd need them, for we had neither wild animals nor savage natives to fear, but I decided that my uncle had his reasons. The weather was overcast but calm when we began our journey to Mount Sneffels. What do I risk? I reasoned. We will take a walk and climb a mountain, and if worse comes to worse, descend into a crater of an extinct volcano. It took a full ten days to reach the foot of Mount Sneffels. My uncle and I rode horses. Two more carried our equipment, but nothing could persuade Hans to climb on the back of any animal, so we made the trip on foot. Right there. Along the way, we had to cross small mountains and large ones, and flatlands and fjords, those swirling bodies of water surrounded by rocky cliffs thousands of feet high. Hans led the way in such an easy manner that I began to believe that he could, indeed, lead us anywhere, even to the center of the earth. We left the horses and began to climb Mount Sneffels in single file. Hans led the way along paths so narrow that two men could not pass. There was no time nor place for conversation, so we climbed in silence. As we advanced, the road became difficult. Rocks bro broke under our feet and went rushing off the side of the mountain into the plains below. The cold was intense, and the wind blew violently. We had to avoid constant falls, yet Hans moved up the slope as if he were walking across a flat plain. We spent the first night on the side of the crater, too excited to eat or sleep, but sleep finally did come, and the morning brought a surprise when we looked up. We were near the summit of one of, one of Mount Sneffel's two peaks. What did you call this peak? My uncle asked Hans. Skarthurus, he replied with the usual one-word answer that was his way. A few more hours brought us to the summit and to the edge of the crater. I looked down into the inverted cone-shaped hole half a mile wide and thought, to descend into this crater is like descending into the interior of a cannon. One is loaded and ready to go off. This is the act of a madman. But I knew that I would soon do just that. I felt like a lamb being led to slaughter. We began our descent into the huge cone-shaped crater, passing volcanic rocks and layers of deep, soft snow. We were tied to each other by a long rope to prevent accidents. By midday, we were at the bottom of the crater, which was composed of three separate shafts. It was through these shafts that Sneffels, when it was erupting, sent up its burning lava and poisonous vapors. My uncle ran to examine each of the three shafts, breathless with delight. Hans, seated on a pile of lava, looked at my uncle as if he were a lunatic. Suddenly, my uncle uttered a wild, unearthly cry. Harry! Harry! Come here, quickly! This is wonderful! I ran to his side. Look here! he cried, pointing at a rock wall. I looked where he pointed. There, carved in the rock wall, was a name I had hoped never to see again. Arn Sucknossum! Dun dun dun! 